This week we pick up where Phyllis Day left off after the end of Chapter 9, which really kind of covered the era of the New Deal and the great, great changes that occurred in terms of social welfare, welfare programming during the Social Security implementation in, in the, era, or the years that followed. Um, during this period of time previous to, well, actually at the beginning of the period of time that we're covering in this chapter, the Social Security Act and the New Deal programs were implemented and World War II was fought and came to an end. And uh, as I think we discussed in previous uh, the previous chapter, the veterans returned to the United States with some assistance in terms of getting on their feet. But ultimately, there was a lot of pressure put on women to leave the workforce and to return to the home. As you might recall, during the Second World War, women were actually, well, they were even talking about drafting women to, to work in factories if they didn't want to volunteer to do that. But they were actively recruited to join the workforce while the men were overseas and to join in, in the war effort, making that uh, contribution and that uh, making that their contribution. Likewise, African Americans who have historically been uh, last hired, first fired, were also brought into the workforce in larger numbers than they had been previously uh, and enjoyed more economic success, I think, in this era than they had uh, at any point before this. So when, when, this, when the uh, veterans come back and they're given some period of time with the help of the GI Bill to, to reintegrate into the workforce, space had to be cleared in the workforce for them and so women were pressured to leave and uh, to return to the home and uh, African Americans also found themselves losing work once again. Very uh, likely that these years were the um, years of sowing seeds for both the women's liberation movement or the feminist movement that reignited itself in the late 1950s and early 1960s as well as the civil rights movement which really picked up in the late 40s, continued through the 50s and 60s, and even on into the 1980s. Both groups found that they could function successfully in the workforce if they were given the opportunity to do that. Uh, women in particular discovered they really didn't need men to be able to run a household if, if, if they were given the opportunity to work, uh, and many wanted to do that. The uh, forces of society were great in, for instance, in keeping women in place. Uh, there were a number of different theories that developed during this period of time, blaming working mothers for many of the ills of society. A new interest in juvenile delinquency, for instance, developed during this period of time, and working mothers were blamed for the increase in in what was seen as juvenile crime in these years. Um, uh, there were some theories developed, for instance, that also that mothers were to blame for the development of schizophrenia in, in their sons, and uh, also the nature of their relationship with their sons. They were also blamed for um, creating homosexual children. Uh, and so there were a number of things where women were carrying a lot of burden to demonstrate that they were raising their children properly and, and, and to fulfill the expectation that they'd be in the home and not working. And so this chapter covers uh, both the, the development of the civil rights era and, and uh, some of the great uh, efforts that were made during that period of time to work for equal rights for racial minorities um, and, um, and also covers the period of time when the feminist movement became uh, much more uh, active and involved in society and had a lot to do with the changes in gender role expectations that have really happened since that time. I have several slides here that will tell you a little bit about what was going on in economics and the social sphere during the years following World War II. For one thing, uh, the real disposable income, that is our purchasing power, doubled from the period of time uh, at the beginning of the, of the Second World War until 1970. The gross national product, now I believe we refer to it as a gross domestic product, and I'm not really sure what the difference is, but in those days it was the GNP. The GNP rose uh, by 10 times uh, during, during this same period of time, and the gross national product became nearly $1 trillion. And if you remember back to the early weeks of our, of our um, class, you'll remember that one of the factors that determines whether or not social welfare programs 
are um, implemented and how, and how many programs, let's say, are put in place is the amount of money that's available in the economy. So with the GNP rising so much, there was an increase in social welfare expenditures during this period of time. And yet, the poverty rate for African Americans still remained three times that of uh, white Americans. And 32%, nearly one-third of all non-white populations, lived below the poverty line in 1970s still. Non-white unemployment was more than twice that of whites. And for non-white teens, the unemployment rate was more than four times that of the adult white population. So you can see that as there was an economic boom, much like other periods of time in our history, the uh, benefits of the economic expansion were not shared equally in our population and, and uh, racial minorities in particular uh, and other poor individuals didn't share in the in the good times. But interestingly, during this period of time, the overall poverty rate decreased and there were different reasons for that. And uh, f uh, well, well, we'll talk about the significance of this in a moment, but uh, among the reasons why the overall poverty rate decreased was that there was an increase in wages and earnings overall in the economy during that period of time. There, were more mo there was more money. Wages were going up some. Um, there were more women earning in the labor force. Women had, some women had stayed in the workforce, so there were more workers and more, there was more money coming into the household. So we began to see more uh, two income households during this period of time. And uh, greater mobility because of the automobile and better mass transit also allowed individuals to move around to take jobs in other parts of the city or to move to other parts of the country where work might have been more plentiful. But one of the other things that is kind of a hidden uh, f feature of uh, social welfare programming that uh, a lot of people don't realize is the fact that the poverty rate also decreased because of the various income transfer programs which were implemented following the New Deal and the Social Security Act in 1935. Well, veterans benefits, you know, the GI Bill, as we had talked about in, in a few weeks back, if you'll recall, um, helped helped the veterans to uh, reintegrate into society economically, kept them out of the workforce for a period of time, but still gave them some money, um, and then also funded them in terms of going back to school or buying houses or establishing themselves in business or in a farm, those kinds of things. And so, so veterans benefits, um, really, a lot of people think that the GI Bill was one of the reasons why the middle class became such a strong uh, part of American life in the 1950s and why why America of the 1950s is kind of seen as this uh, uh, sort of economic nirvana where everybody was happy. It really wasn't that way, but nonetheless, that's sort of the image we have of that period of time. And, and uh, because our, our poverty rate was going down and there was more money and a lot of the reason had to do with the fact that uh, veterans were enjoying these benefits uh, post-World War II. Likewise, we had other uh, entitlement programs that we didn't have previously, such as unemployment compensation, workers' compensation, uh, Social Security for retired individuals, the aid to families with dependent children, that should be AFDC, not ADFC. Um, uh, all of these programs put hands or put money in the hands of individuals who um, wouldn't otherwise have it. And so with these uh, public assistance programs, these, these uh, entitlement programs, income transfer programs, there is more money in the economy to be spent and so it is a benefit to the economy to have these individuals have these funds. Uh, a significant uh, uh, development in 1946, this is again right, right uh, near the beginning of this era, was that the Council of Economic Advisors was created. And you'll hear about this if you listen to the news when there's discussions of the economy. And, and this is a group of individuals who advise our government, our federal government, our leaders uh, about how best to um, deal with uh, things regarding, well, the unemployment rate, fiscal and monetary policy, and those kinds of things. So the government, with the, with the development, the creation of the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, began to consciously use uh, fiscal and monetary policy and the federal budget, budget to manage uh, the economic stability of our nation. And they do that through the control of employment, uh, production rates, uh, price levels, um, those kinds of things. They can um, really, you know, the unemployment rate in, in many respects is, is able to be manipulated uh, uh, through economic policy. And, and this is the 
this is the group that helps to uh, advise the government about that, whether to ri let unemployment rise uh, or to fall. Uh, the unemployment rate, the, the, the discussion about the unemployment rate these days, there are reasons why um, some individuals in, in the business world, let's say, wouldn't necessarily want to see the unemployment rate get too good. If you remember from our early days in this class, the more the, the fuller the employment, the more wages are going to go up. And so a high unemployment rate uh, has the effect of keeping wages down and in a time of uh, tough economic times such as we experience, um, you know, in the early 2000 teens, so to speak, um, low wages isn't such a bad thing. And so while there's a lot of pressure from an individual level on the government to lower the unemployment rate and create more jobs uh, from from the production standpoint, let's say from the from the power elite standpoint, a higher unemployment rate may be of some benefit because it enables them to maintain uh, better profits. So this is just the uh, kind of the tip of the iceberg, and I am not an economist, and so I, I really, you know, I'm not qualified to go into great detail in describing this, but just suffice to say that the government can manipulate all of these kinds of things in order to uh, bring about the most favorable economic condition for the nation. After the war, the federal government for the first time really began to recognize responsibility to those with lifetime attachments to the workforce. You'll recall the government, the federal government, long ago recognized the the debt that, that it owed to veterans of, of its wars, and and so had taken on federal uh, assistance programs for the veterans and through various forms. Now, now the federal government uh, has accepted uh, responsibility for taking care of the people who have contributed to the economy throughout their lifetime, and so the Social Security Act really is what that's all about. And and um, during this period of time, the Social Security uh, Act grew to include coverage for disabled workers. We had talked about this a few weeks ago, and and also added health insurance for retired individuals through Medicare. But at the same time, organized labor. You remember the unions have been, for the last hundred to hundred and fifty years of the history, had really been involved in social change and in advocating for uh, improvements in the conditions of the poor and workers and those kinds of things but through the implementation of the New Deal programs and a lot of the changes that occurred in the 1930s and 1940s in terms of the 40-hour work week and uh, collective bargaining uh, laws and uh, workers compensation child labor laws those kinds of things um, unions really kind of achieved the kinds of, of uh, changes that they were looking for and um, as a result organized labor really begins to focus upon maintaining the status quo much more than uh, being uh, involved in any kind of social change and so so really the at least you know up until the modern day I would say that the labor unions have continued to be more focused upon workers and worker rights in improving the conditions of those already employed and not really dealing much with the individual with the um, the circumstances surrounding the poor in in this era uh, employment was increasingly seen as the solution to poverty this has been the theme throughout our history and social welfare in this nation certainly but uh, once again a renewed effort to implement employment programs and employment training in order to uh, you know find some resolution to poverty or so it was thought so the government really focuses upon developing employability through different kinds of counseling and training and work incentives in their programs the cause of poverty definitely was seen as being individual once again we had we had uh, reached some sort of recognition of the fact that there were structural causes for poverty during the Great Depression, but as Phyllis Day talks about that pendulum swing, you know, and 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 once again we we sort of go into this period of denial about the structural reasons for poverty because the economy is doing so well, and and, and uh, working so well for so many people that those who weren't getting along well it was just kind of felt that it was really their their issue their fault for that because it was working well for so many other people and a social work profession really kind of um, again you know really kind of wasn't involved in any sort of uh, advocacy for the poor or or uh, challenging the social structure at all but really uh, social work training very much focused upon casework and therapeutic interventions uh, to address the problems of the individual not to change society <laughs> 
As mentioned earlier, the Aid to Dependent Children program from the Social Security Act, ADC, became AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, because the caretaker was added to the grant. The, the, the mother who was unemployed was added to the grant. Now, this has a sort of a psychological effect upon society in a, in a sense, or the public in a sense, because the focus now suddenly is we're, we're actually providing some funds to the unemployed parent as well as to the children of those unemployed parents. And so um, a, a great deal of focus gets placed upon that mother, largely, not working, rather than the fact that this program is helping children and, uh, from poor families. And so there's quite a backlash to dependency. Is, and, and some people believe that the uh, welfare rolls grew because of the fact that the caretakers were added to their grants. And that's not really the reason that, uh, that uh, public assistance rolls grew. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But, but there really was a focus, a belief upon the work ethic and, uh, the, and also a sense that the economic growth that, that uh, the society was enjoying was, would end poverty if we could just let it be. And, and so a lot of people just really continued to believe that public assistance was harmful uh, and that poverty was individually created. It was an individual fault. Politically, during this period of time, it was a very scary period in the 1950s. Uh, you, you might have heard about the Red Scare or the Red Menace of the 1950s. Uh, Senator Joe McCarthy from Wisconsin and, and, and many others led this period, I think a very dark period in our history that um, where individuals were called out of all sorts of um, places of industry and in the film industry and in public employment and everything, um, there was this witch hunt for communists and government and communists infiltrating our, our businesses. And um, it, it really is something that is worth reading about if you, if you like American history at all. This is something that, that you should read because it's a period of time where just innuendo um, one person saying they think another person might have attended a communist meeting, you know, 20 years before was enough to have that person labeled and uh, individuals' careers were terribly destroyed through all of this. It was really, um, really an ugly period of, of, uh, of our history. Uh, and McCarthy uh, referred to the Roosevelt and Truman administration and the social programs of those two administrations as 20 years of treason. Now, the AFDC roles uh, did increase during this period of time, and there were a lot of other factors aside from the, the uh, caretaker being added to the grant that could explain that. For one thing, the population increased. Secondly, there was an increase in the divorce rate uh, following the Second World War and the veterans coming back. Um, I think, again, the, maybe the early stages of the women's movement, their social change was underway, and, and uh, women pr were beginning to... Uh, feel as though they could function more independently and and so the divorce rate was increasing uh, there were more out of wedlock births as well and a lot of the farm workers were displaced uh, from from the from working in agriculture and moved to the cities and so there were a lot of different reasons why why there was w more of a demand for public assistance during this period of time again these are some of the structural reasons, uh, not individual fault, that, that uh, individuals needing pu public assistance, um, poverty, in other words, might have increased during this period of time. But because of this backlash that was going on, not only the Red Scare, but just this general backlash against public dependency and, and, uh, and with the civil rights movement uh, gaining steam, some concern about racial minorities also in, among the, uh, you know, challenging the status quo. Uh, program administration through with the AFTC program really became pretty, um, uh, pretty vicious in many ways. And the AFTC worker was, was uh, sanctioned to uh, use and usually her, but it could be his, um, his own authority in determining whether or not a person was suitable to, to raise kids. And um, the, the AFTC worker was actually the person who made decisions about whether children stayed in homes or not. There, we didn't really have child protection laws at, at that point yet. And, and so um, services, social services were provided by the same person who was, who was providing the check, so to speak. And so the, this individual had a lot of control over these families, and they would um, determine whether or not an individual was suitable as a parent based in large part upon what 
well, their, that person's lifestyle. And that was based upon, of course, the value system of the social worker, uh, who generally were white middle class women, as I said. And so it was, uh, again, you know, not a particularly, uh, not an era that I think social work can be proud of as far as, as far as, um, this program is concerned. There were, if, if there was a man in the house, for instance, um, that was enough to take somebody's check away. You know, the assumption then was that there was somebody there earning money and that the, the woman was uh, not living alone and wasn't dependent, was, was defrauding the government more or less. And, and the workers would actually make midnight raids. I mean, literally going to the house at, at night and demanding to be let in and looking to see who was sleeping with who, checking closets to see if men's clothing were there, men's shoes, even looking at cigarette butts in the ashtray and whose cigarette butts are these, those kinds of things. It was, um, there, it was just a terrible time for, for recipients in that period of time because of the backlash against public dependency. The civil rights movement, as I said, is was was um, beginning to gain steam during this period of time, and um, uh, just some of the early years of the civil rights movement. You know, during the Eisenhower administration, which was most of the 1950s, the um, uh, some of the demographic things that were going on in this during this period included the middle class moving to the suburbs, kind of leaving the inner cities, and so the inner cities were seeing an. Um, an immigration of people of color and the poor, uh, individuals that didn't have a lot of uh, transportation, for instance, you know, and things like that might move in into the city where the work was more close by. But the middle class was leaving the city, and so you had this uh, separation, that, that uh, this widening gap between the races and the social classes that, that really became more evident in the 1950s. One uh, very large landmark Supreme Court decision, and we will talk about other Supreme Court decisions uh, later uh, in a few more slides, but one of the biggest ones during this period of time was Brown versus Topeka. Uh, this is an, uh, an order of the, of the um, I believe it was still the Earl Warren Court, and Earl Warren was the Chief Justice in 1954, and this this uh, ruling overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. If you remember, Plessy versus Ferguson said uh, in 1896 that separate was okay as long as the f separate facilities were acceptable, as long as they were equal, and uh, Brown versus Topeka says separate in and of itself uh, dictated that equal was not possible, and so the separate but equal. Um, policy, let's say, of the government, that was essentially that, uh, you know, that legalized and, and inst institutionalized segregation was overturned by Brown versus Topeka. This was the end of the era of legal se segregation. Oh, well, by law. In fact, um, I believe that um, uh, it was the next year, I think in 1955, the court had to issue another ruling that said to 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 uh, schools and other organizations. Listen, you know we really mean this, and and um, I believe the term was the orderly desegregation of schools or something like that was 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 ordered. But the the the, the um, institutions of society were told, you know, you got to get with it, and with uh, with appropriate haste or whatever, uh, start making these changes. Brown versus Topeka Board of Education overturned legalized segregation, or ended it, I should say. Um, and as we found during this period of time with the Supreme Court rulings, people, you know, the institutions of society and different segments of a culture were very, very slow to respond to this. And, and um, what we learned, well, I can remember even listening as a boy during this period of time and listening to the news that, you know, them talking about de facto segregation and de jure segregation. And this is sort of the difference, you know, that when a law changes, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that uh, the society's behaviors change until it's really enforced and the civil rights uh, legislation was just so complex and, and there were so many different layers of issues related to it uh, whether it was a state uh, responsibility or federal responsibility uh, you know those kinds of things that um, the laws would change but it would still be years before behaviors were changing and so de facto segregation means this is what's really going on de jure means by law so uh, de jure segregation when like under Plessy there was de jure segregation but um, when when that was outlawed by Brown versus Topeka Board of Education 
um, de facto segregation continued in many, many um, pockets of society all around the country. And as a result of this, the militancy of the civil rights uh, movement begins to grow because of the ineffectiveness of the court decisions. And organizations begin to form uh, uh, CORE and uh, SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That was Martin, the uh, organization that Martin Luther King was the head of uh, for much of the 1950s and 60s. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Um, SNCC was um, uh, really... Um, um, or, uh, tried to coordinate with Dr. King and, and the SCLC, but became very frustrated with um, uh, Dr. King's um, tendency oftentimes to back away from confrontation in certain situations. Uh, the uh, SNCC was much, uh, much more um, impatient, I think, as an organization and kept pressuring S the Southern Le Christian Leadership Conference to move forward with things. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, kind of uh, interaction in history. And if you ever, again, if you ever get the opportunity to watch the Eyes and the Prize series, um, you'll see a lot about the interactions between the SCLC and, and, and SNCC. Uh, the Nation of Islam was, um, was now the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and, to, and, and uh, SNCC both uh, focused upon uh, nonviolent uh, means of, of uh, protest, you know, so that it was civil, disobe civil disobedience was the, um, the, the um, you know, the primary mode of, of protest, I suppose you'd say, kind of along the lines of Gandhi's uh, theories and, and practices. So uh, the sit-ins at lunch counters and the freedom rides and, uh, you know, the different kinds of things that they would do where they would passively resist um, the 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 uh, laws which enforced, uh, you know, oppression and things like that. Um, that was the that was that that nonviolent civil disobedience was was the technique used by King, Dr. King and and his followers. The Nation of Islam, however, uh, preached a different kind of a thought. Uh, it was a much more militant um, uh, kind of um, intervention, and uh, uh, in many respects was very separatist. Whereas uh, SCLC sought to integrate. Um, the racial minorities into the larger society and have them benefit from their interactions and integration into society. The Nation of Islam, in many respects, wanted uh, was it was more of a separatist movement, a black separatist movement, uh, and and they really uh, their leader, their primary leader uh, was Elijah Muhammad, but uh, the person who became very well known in in American society during this period of time was Malcolm X and he was something of a spokesman for them until well there there was a falling out and and uh, Malcolm X left the nation of Islam and in fact there are many people I believe it may we've it may have even been uh, demonstrated that uh, Malcolm X when he was assassinated I think in 1965 that there were other people within the nation of Islam who who actually arranged for his murder but the Black Panther Party was also another more militant organization that actually grew out of the uh, the uh, voting rights uh, uh, movement in in Alabama in the nineteen in the nineteen mid nineteen sixties. So many different organizations begin to develop um, to encourage along the the development of of uh, civil rights. At the same time, of course, the you know it's not surprising probably to find that the uh, Ku Klux Klan. Uh, becomes energized and strengthened as, as sort of a backlash and, uh, to um, to the changes that the civil rights movement was was proposing, and the responses uh, to these kinds of things included uh, marches and demonstrations, the freedom rides, uh, like you saw in the video of the freedom riders in last week's uh, learning unit. I hope um, sit-ins, other acts of nonviolent uh, civil disobedience. And there were some outbreaks of violence in the cities that developed in the 1960s as well. So reforms begin to happen on a legislative basis because of the social pressure that uh, is brought to bear upon the government. And during the Kennedy and Johnson administrations and in the, throughout the 1960s, um, there there were some changes that started under the Kennedy administration. It's 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 interesting. Um, because uh, John Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy were associated very much with civil rights, uh, you know, was uh, seen as, as friends of the civil rights movement and in fact um, gradually became that. But 
um, John Kennedy, particularly during his administration, um, he was he was elected in 1960 and was due to be um, reelected in 1964. He was up to to re be reelected, and he really didn't want the the uh, civil rights movement to push things quite as much as they were during his first administration because he knew uh, that he relied upon the Southern Democrats to be reelected, and uh, the Southern Democratic party was not in favor of civil rights they were they were really kind of a bunch of uh, um, old guard uh, status quo uh, individuals that really believed in segregation and 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 didn't want to see the the uh, the status quo up ended in the south and so uh, Kennedy really would have preferred not to have to deal with civil rights issues uh, in his first administration uh, because he was concerned that it threatened his chances for re-election but events occurred and he was forced to kind of get out in front of it more or less and 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 uh, eventually did so um, there was some funding uh, provided for social work education during the Kennedy years but but uh, it really was focused upon the development of uh, you know uh, ways to address individual problems that that led to poverty and those kinds of things that really it wasn't a forward-thinking kind of uh, social work legislation as far as I could tell at least um, and the civil rights legislation began during the Kennedy years, but uh, he was uh, assassinated in November 1963, about two and a half years into his first term. And um, um, these none, really, there wasn't much legislation passed uh, before his death. It was until after he was dead that the legislation passed. And I believe, in fact, uh, it was really quite stalled in Congress uh, at the time of his death. But uh, Lyndon Johnson, who, who came from the Senate, and he was uh, Kennedy's vice president, so he became president when Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, he had been a very powerful senator and, and uh, knew how to work the Senate and, and, and uh, I, I perhaps kind of played on the, the sympathies at the time following the Kennedy assassination and the nation's grief, uh, civil rights uh, became a much more popular cause and and uh, Johnson was able to push through a number of changes uh, in legislation in the, in the early 1960s through the middle of 1960s and you can see the list here and we're going to talk about each of these. First, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 when uh, and this was an historic moment and uh, that uh, which incidentally occurred uh, f uh, Martin Luther King's speech um, uh, the I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial was in August of 1963 and so it was following that time that the Civil Rights Act was passed the first Civil Rights Act and uh, declared that it was unlawful to apply unequal standards in voter registration it indicated that discrimination and segregation in pit places of public accommodation would, was declared illegal. It encouraged the orderly desegregation of schools and um, the US government gained the authority to enforce these things through the Attorney General's office on a legal standpoint uh, through civil you know like uh, looking at um, trying people on civil rights violations and through the withdrawal of federal funding that if, if uh, agencies or governments uh, or programs uh, didn't um, uh, didn't fall along and you know continue to practice segregation or whatever they if they received any any federal funding they could lose that federal funding through this act in 1965 Lyndon Johnson uh, pushed through a voting rights act which uh, clarifies further things uh, regarding um, problems particularly in the south regarding um, African Americans having um, an opportunity to vote. And there was quite a confrontation going on in the South, uh, Alabama and Mississippi, uh, in particular, um, about voting rights and, and rights to enroll in school and those kinds of things. And so, one of the things that they would do as um, as a, as uh, the laws required that all citizens be allowed to vote, and and African Americans were citizens, of course was that local uh, local rules would include things like you had to uh, your grandfather had to have been able to vote in order for you to be eligible to vote well that wouldn't happen of course with many with uh, with many African Americans um, some had to take a literacy test and as we already know uh, African Americans historically have been denied uh, equal access to education and so many of them were uneducated 
um, pay poll taxes, very living poor lives. They didn't have an opportunity to pay taxes. And so these kinds of things that were put in place that if you had to pass literacy tests and pay a tax in order to vote. And so the, the Voting Rights Act of 65 outlawed literacy tests and poll taxes and, and essentially uh, ended legalized segregation. And it get in, by enfranchising the blacks, we're talking about the blacks really getting the vote throughout the South. Um, and in, in many areas where uh, there was a, a quite a concentration of African American population, uh, whites still ran the government in those areas, and so this really began to upend the white control in those in those areas of the South. In terms of poverty, Congress passed the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964 uh, and focused upon areas where poverty was concentrated, and. Um, the, the, there was sort of some radical elements to the Economic, economic Opportunity Act in that uh, rather than giving um, federal funds to local governments, um, because they've been doing that already, um, and having those governments distribute the funding to causes and, per, and persons and agencies that they felt most appropriate, sort of, you know, continuing to contribute to the status quo, what what the uh, Economic Opportunity Act did was to provide money to community action agencies to kind of bypass the local governments and put the money in the hands of the of the community action agencies so that uh, the social workers, the activists, let's say the individuals working for social change could determine how best to use those funds. Now, um, the, the purpose of this was really intended to kind of calm things down because, you know, some violence had begun to erupt and some, some uh, riots and uh, in, in cities had begun to uh, occur and so so the Economic Opportunity Act was intended to to calm these riots and provide jobs and training to those people that were most likely to rebel that the, you know the poor and the racial minorities and and it, it certainly did have the um, um, effect of, of quelling the rebellion with these benefits but what happened is is the leaders of, of, of the community action agencies were kind of co-opted into uh, local governments and things like this and so in the end um, local governments still managed to find ways to to manipulate and control this monies and and so there really wasn't as much uh, change as, as was theoretically going to occur because of this and, and in the end there was no change in the individual fault uh, casework mentality um, it, it just didn't change as much as it as it, it had been hoped that it would the Social Security Act saw some amendments uh, in 1964 and 1965. We saw Title 18, the Medicare Act, uh, put in place. This was uh, a non-means-tested method of providing health insurance for the uh, retired individuals, persons on Social Security retirement. And um, Medicaid was passed the following year, Title 19. That is a means-tested health insurance program that you have to qualify uh, because of poverty. In, uh, for for this type of health insurance, and and Medicaid is generally associated and connected to people who receive AFDC, um, and even to this day to the TANF funds, the public assistance funds, uh, and uh, SSI. In 1967, payments and services were split in the Social Security Act, and so what this did in effect was to take. Um, remember, I was telling you about the all-powerful public assistance worker who could go into homes and uh, make determinations about whether people were fit or not. Uh, what this did was it split payments and services so that uh, public assistance agencies would have workers who focused upon eligibility of of of, of um, for 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 public assistance you know the dollars and cents piece the check and other workers would focus upon uh, things like providing basic social services and child protection and those kinds of things so so funding was split there and and uh, the idea being not to mix payments and services job training and employment was still the number one priority the the big job program for welfare recipients during that period of time was the win program the work incentive program they also added this thing called the 30 and one-third income disregard and AFDC eligibility this was intended to encourage um, welfare recipients to go to work and if you went to work uh, when you sat down with your public assistance worker uh, the first thirty dollars of your earnings and, and understand thirty dollars wasn't a lot of money in those days but it meant a lot more than it does today so the first thirty dollars of your income and then the next one-third of your income were disregarded when determining AFTC eligibility in other words it was just kind of 
removed from the income figure that you used to determine how eligible you were so that uh, the idea was is that a person who went to work would have an incentive to work because they could get more money that way you know because that part of the income was disregarded in determining eligibility that was only earned income though by the way I don't have that on my slide this is not like if somebody was giving you money that didn't count uh, this was only for earned income disregard so that was about work uh, the final piece of legislation that uh, Phyllis Day talks about, I believe, is the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which and just as a way to show, you know, you have to keep defining what where equal rights are and what civil rights means. And here we are over the course of four or five years throughout the 60s, new laws having to be passed to plug the, the holes, I let's say, in, in as far as compliance goes around the nation. And the Civil Rights Act of 1968 extended civil rights uh, to, into housing and forbade uh, housing discrimination based on race. Now, Martin Luther King would have told you and and others would have told you that in, in fact to this day that discrimination based on race uh, still continues in housing uh, through many different kinds of techniques and practices of real estate agents um, practice but uh, that's for another discussion the Supreme Court was very busy during this period of time too and so here's a list of, of some Supreme Court decisions I you notice I put um, just just for the sake of um, reminding you, let's say, you know, the, the Dred Scott decision of 1857 and the Plessy decision of 1896, those two decisions we've already talked about, but I added them here just so you could kind of put them in context of the other decisions. And as I mentioned earlier, Brown versus Topeka Board of Education in 1954 the ruling of the Supreme Court said separate could not be equal. So it overturned Plessy the separate but equal in 1996. In 1966, Miranda versus Arizona, you know about, you've heard about the Miranda warning. You have a right to um, an attorney. You have a right to, to be whatever silent. I'm happy to say I, I don't really remember the, as much as I watch Law and Order. I can't, I can't think of the words for it right now. But basically, you know, you're advised of your rights if you're arrested. Um, Miranda uh, um, was the act that, that or the ruling of the Supreme Court that, that gave suspects the right to, to be advised of their rights at the time of their arrest and to be told that they're being arrested. Uh, in 1967, um, in the Loving versus Virginia decision, um, laws against interracial marriage were outlawed. And I don't remember her, first, her, her maiden name, but Mrs. Loving, I believe, and her husband, well, they left Virginia to, because Virginia had laws against interracial marriages and, and the term for that that was used in the 1950s and 60s was miscegenation uh, interracial marriages and so miscegenation was illegal in, in, in several states and so uh, I think Mrs. Loving was black and Mr. Loving was white could have it backwards but I believe that's the way it is they left Virginia to get married in another state where interracial marriage was not prohibited and then eventually moved back and were living in Virginia when the police I guess literally woke them up one night got them out of bed and arrested them uh, for their interracial marriage and so the uh, Supreme Court declared in 1967 that laws against interracial marriages were not constitutional and so it's another um, <clears throat> step in in the in the civil rights um, uh, improvements 1967 the Galt decision affects the rights of juvenile offenders and and the Galt decision is the reason that juvenile offenders have a right to an attorney have a right to confront their their uh, accusers and uh, uh, et cetera et cetera just like an adult does um, if you remember when the um, um, juvenile courts were were established in the early 1900s. Uh, I believe we talked about the judges kind of acting in. I believe the term was in parents' patriae, so sort of in the place of the parent. So that if if um, little Albert, you know, got picked up off the streets for for shoplifting uh, when he was 13 years old, the the judge could decide to put him in detention until he was 21. Um, because he didn't have a proper parent let's say and so or you know because he felt that you know that he was going to get into more trouble and and kind of like you know grounding him to detention for the next eight years well you know if as an adult you uh you shoplifted you know you might 
your your penalty would be much less than that. And so, what Galt's decision, what the Galt decision basically said was, is that that juvenile that what happens to juveniles has to be parallel with what happens to adults in the system, and juveniles should have the same rights as adults when they're accused of a crime. So the idea of of um, of the courts kind of taking on the parental role with children uh, was modified quite a bit. Now, juvenile court still has different philosophies from the adult correction system, but again, that's something that we can talk. I think we'll talk about that later in, in the semester. And although it's sort of outside the, this time frame because the, this period theoretically ends in 1970 that we're studying, in 1973, Roe v. Wade, this is the, um, the decision where the Supreme Court struck down the laws prohibiting abortion around the United States. And this is a law that is still very much under review uh, by the courts. The current uh, Supreme Court is, is uh, thought to be rather conservative, and um, should the law regarding uh, Roe v. Wade uh, should in abortion laws be, in fact it has been modified some already over the years uh, but uh, um, there are still people who are hoping to bring Roe v. Wade uh, back before the Supreme Court and have Roe v. Wade overturned. Uh, most of the justices have said that Roe v. Wade is, is sort of established law and and uh, you know that it's not something that, that is open for review any longer it's just the way it is but uh, Really, when you look at Plessy versus Ferguson, um, you know, it was in place for uh, 58 years before it was overturned. So um, I, I would think that was probably considered established law at that time, too. And, and so uh, this is something worth watching in, in the years ahead, you know, what, what the Supreme Court does with abortion rights. Lyndon Johnson, when he, I think it was in the... Um, it might have been his first um, uh, State of the Union address in 1964, but certainly by 1965 had declared what he called a war on poverty. He envisioned a great society. That was his, the name of his program, was the Great Society Programs. And, and the war on poverty was a part of that. And he wanted to, uh, Lyndon Johnson really wanted to kind of take uh, Roosevelt's programs and bring them uh more into fruition, you know, to, to really bring the New Deal and, and integrate it into the uh, lives of Americans much more thoroughly than it had been. And uh, in a sense, you know, to, uh, of course, the backlash that had been struggling against that, he, he was, he was uh, um, saw himself as somebody who was going to more or less save the New Deal and, and see that it got implemented fully. And so his uh, legislative program to end poverty in the United States included the, well, the Social Security Act amendments that we had talked about earlier, several different job training programs such as the Work Incentive Program, CETA, which is the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, and this is something I think we talk about more next week. It's a, it was a really a very uh, interesting program uh, for providing training opportunities for unemployed, low-income um, um, individuals from from. Uh, from poor neighborhoods and things like this, and was really quite creative. In fact, um, the Job Corps is it still exists today, but it was much, much more, uh, a much um, larger presence uh, in the 1960s than it has today. Many different anti-poverty uh, programs through the Office of Equal Economic Opportunity. I'm sorry, the Office of Equal Opportunity, which grew out of the um, legislation that that we had talked about in um, 1964 that was the um, um, Economic Opportunity Act, Head Start, Upward Bound, um, Food Stamp Program was established. Uh, actually, I think it got started during the Kennedy administration, but uh, more fully implemented during during Johnson's administration. The Food Stamp Program um, really was, um, and, and now it's uh, here we have. They don't have stamps anymore. They don't have cards anymore. They have, uh, you know, they don't have those things that look like funny money. Now that you have, you have, um, like an ATM card you swipe. And, and, uh, I think it's called Quest in Alaska. <clears throat> and, um, but the food stamp program was a Department of Agriculture program. And, uh, the, the intent of, um, of this food stamp program was to redistribute surplus food to the needy. I should say re redistribute surplus food to needy, not on needy. Um, but it also provides support for the farmers because uh, um, you know that that uh, gave the farmers an, uh, some other some other place to uh, send food and things like this. So so it's also subsidy for farmers, and that's why uh, it's a program of the United States Department of Agriculture. <clears throat> 
my first job out of college was certifying individuals for food stamps in Central Florida. Uh, the mental health acts uh, increased funds for training of social workers and and also the Department of Housing and Urban Development was established under Lyndon Johnson HUD uh, which was also um, well I think its intent is fairly obvious from its title um, more schools offering uh, social work education um, and and some of those schools really focused upon things like community organizing and social issues uh, and so there was a bit of a return to uh, something of a kind of well they called it radical social work in those days and there were in fact some schools that called themselves radical social work schools uh, but but by and large most of the uh, social work schools continued to focus upon uh, training the individuals for casework and, and individual interventions and uh, using Freudian and neo-Freudian kinds of theories of personality development to understand the human condition. It really, uh, by and large, the social work profession, while there was, an, again, an opportunity there, there was an opening where... Um, it was becoming more activist again in the 1960s, and these are the kinds of things that really was uh, encouraged in the Johnson administration. Um, the the profession as a whole, I think, uh, didn't really uh, adopt that that uh, activist mode. And with the loss of uh, the charismatic leaders uh, through assassination, when Malcolm X was assassinated in 1965 and Martin Luther King in 1968, the civil rights movement uh, splintered. When you study basic uh, basic uh, sociology courses, you know, and you talk about leadership, if you remember, um, uh, charismatic leadership is one type of leadership. And the problem with charismatic leadership, which is really based upon the strength of the personality of one individual, the leader, when uh, when that individual leaves, when that individual dies, oftentimes um, there isn't anybody that can fill the void that's left by that person because nobody has the strength of the personality that the leader had. And so um, organizations led by a charismatic leader or a movement led by a charismatic leader may die off after that and splinter. And, and um, while the civil rights movement continues and this the SCLC and maybe SNCC, I don't know, CORE and those organizations continue to exist today. Um, uh, you know, they don't have the, uh, the oomph, they don't have that uh, enthusiasm that they had in the 1950s and the 1960s. And so um, they're much more bureaucratized. There's, uh, if, if every now and then you'll read about some infighting uh, going on within the organizations and those kinds of things. And so that's kind of what happens to movements. If, you know, if there isn't somebody there to energize them or some new reason, a new cause to energize them. At the time of his assassination in 1968, um, Dr. King was uh, really kind of moving his focus away from um, uh, um, uh, racial oppression and more towards poverty, in fact, and had begun also to uh, look at, at the war and uh, the Vietnam War and and uh, was involving himself in some in uh, anti-war kinds of movements and things. But poverty was seemed to be that was going to be the next area for him. And, uh, um, and so, it, you know, we don't know what might have happened had he lived and what other kinds of things might have changed because there's most people would agree that uh, he was one of those individuals that probably as an individual um, created great change in our society and, and uh, is different the society is different because of of his of his life there was uh, an increase in violence and throughout the 1960s and even um, you know in the 1980s and 1990s you know there have been some instances of, of uh, racial violence in the cities in different parts around the nation and so there's been you know backlash against the implementation of civil rights programs and um, today the modern day uh, backlash against civil rights really is about affirmative action and we're going to talk more about affirmative action in another week or so um, but uh, late in the 1960s um, this backlash to the civil rights movement um, and those changes, the social changes, it just tremendous social change and, and really the civil rights and, and uh, was just one area of change when you, the women's movement um, was very, very prominent during this era and uh, family systems were beginning to change and new ways of seeing marriage were beginning to emerge and, and uh, uh, new types of families were emerging. 
and um, the the hippie movement was was prevalent during this period of time, and the anti-war movement because of Vietnam was beginning to gain steam also. And um, if you can imagine a culture with in a society turning on the news at night and hearing about all of these things at one time, you know, on the one hand it was a very exciting period to uh, to be in the middle of, but on the other hand, for those individuals who are looking for security and predictability in their lives, it was a very disturbing era. And so all of these kinds of changes, you know, I think this backlash kind of developed against these changes. And um, uh, what we wound up doing was uh, electing Richard Nixon president in, in 1968 with uh, uh, on a law and order platform as he campaigned. And, and um, and so the focus really became law and order and late in this period of time. And and uh, Phyllis Day, <coughs> she says, I think <clears throat> perhaps a little optimistically, but she says civil rights legislation is now a permanent part of the polity, although its enforcement may depend upon the willingness of oppressed people to fight for their rights. Um, and I think uh, our history shows that to be true. <clears throat> and And one... Closing statement that I think um, is, is one of these statements, and in, in, in actually uh, in the current uh, editions, this particular quote is no longer in there. She's reworked this quote, and I think this is the best quote, uh, which is the earliest one she had about this thought, so I've kept it. And what she says is, when rebellion threatens, the response is first accommodation. And then, when the force of the movement is dissipated, renewed denial. And what this says is when when um, when the, a society or the, in this particular case our government is is threatened and there's con, there is a concern that uh, the unrest will upend uh, the social order and change the status quo the response then is to try to address the 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 grievances of the of the individuals who are threatening to rebel but when those grievances are addressed and services are put in place and the movement kind of dies down then um, we just go back to the way it was before and this is the cycle that Day talks about in her textbook and think about this threat or, or rather this quote and and what it says in light of some of the uh, reform eras that we have studied over the past several weeks, the progressive era reforms in the early 1900s, um, when um, when socialism really was threatening our society, at least set, threatening the status quo. It was thought it might be uh, threatening the status quo. Um, the New Deal, which was the result of the economic collapse and and uh, and the unrest in the during the Depression, um, and the civil rights movement. You know how. Each of these periods of time, they're a good demonstration of of, uh, uh, of this quote, and so uh, just something for you to think about if you uh, you know if you could kind of explain each of those eras uh, through the through the uh, lens of this quote. I think I think you could, and so with that, um, that's the um, that's the end of the uh, of my lecture on this particular chapter, and. Um, Next, we'll be talking about uh, um, the era following uh, this great change and, and everything like this uh, in the era that begins with Richard Nixon's administration. And um, Nixon really was, uh, you'll find out, was a lot more moderate than uh, we may remember him. And, and was, uh, although was a, he was a Republican, uh, moderate Republicans in, in many respects were all, in many ways more progressive than Democrats were in that era. So that's for next week. And so until we speak again, I hope you have a good week.